Well, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you're listening online, on YouTube and Facebook. Welcome to the Experience Renewal on this glorious, wonderful day. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what Experience actually means. It's from the Latin root word. It means spirit. And in this case, we're referring to the Holy Spirit, Experience Sanctus. In addition, it means breath, which correlates with the Spirit because in a biblical context, we're discussing how Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the apostles at Pentecost, which gave them renewal and purpose and boldness in their faith in Jesus Christ as they ventured out into the world to answer the will of God to make the world a better place. So what are we offering today at today's uh, Spiritus Renewal? Well, first, we invoke the Holy Spirit as Manny did, with praise and worship, to open our hearts and our mind to the speaker, who will give us insight and wisdom based on Ephesians 6.11, wearing the armor of God, especially during these turbulent times. This allows us to become more tuned in with the Holy Spirit, and it opens our hearts so that we can hear and listen to what God is trying to tell each one of us. The speaker... Father James Flynn will give witness and testimony to us so that we know and understand that we're not alone in our struggles, but we can overcome any of them with Jesus at our side. He will help us be renewed in our faith so that we can become a strong disciple of Christ in today's world. After his talk, we will have a question and answer session with Father Flynn. You will then be able to ask Father directly questions and concerns that you personally have on your own faith journey as it relates to wearing the armor of God. Send your questions to Catholic Brothers for Christ on their Facebook page or YouTube page, and Father will answer them as best he can as time permits. We will follow up with a personal reflection from our newly ordained Deacon Paul Mahoney from St. Francis of Assisi in Grapevine, who not long ago was sitting in a pews just like us, asking God to guide him on his personal faith journey. We will then conclude with adoration of the Blessed Sacrament so that we can contemplate in our hearts in deep prayer to see where God is calling us and asking each of us to do in our lives. So why are we doing this? Well, Catholic Brothers for Christ are committed to building the body of Christ and uniting as brothers and witnessing the gospel in all aspects of our life. Our mission is to help men of the same mindset and facilitate a positive change in our culture and our society. We can't wait for other people to do this. So in order to make these changes that are necessary in our culture, we must change ourselves first so that we can encourage change in those around us. Our vision is to make men the spiritual leaders of their household. It's only through their leadership that they will be able to propagate the faith to their children. Our mission comes straight from St. Paul in Romans 12:2, where he says, Do not conform yourself to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is pleasing and perfect. And our core values are the Beatitudes, in which Jesus teaches us how to live daily. So as you can see, the Experience Renewal can be life-changing. It is, it is meant to help men become spiritual leaders in which they need to be to change their society. So my challenge to you is this. Listen with an open heart. Remove the busyness of the world for the next two hours. Enjoy the moment. Allow God to speak through the speakers and through the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist to you today. So there you have it. The meaning and purpose of Experience Renewal. I hope that God will continue to bless you and guide you in becoming the men that you need to become. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker an incredible man of God, a combat army war veteran, graduate of Texas A&M University, 
Born and raised in Granbury, Texas, he's currently the pastor of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Keller, Texas. I'd like to introduce Father James Flynn. Thank you, Father. Well, as uh, Dr. Everline said, I'm Father James Flynn. I'm the pastor here at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Catholic Church in Keller. And it's an honor and a privilege to be here and to speak about the armor of Christ. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I, When I was 18 years old, I joined the Army. I remember my parents went out on vacation. They were gone for a few days. I had just graduated from high school. I had just turned 18 years old. And I knew that college at that time was not going to be in my future. I loved going to school. I just hated classes. And so uh, it, I knew that something else had to be within my future besides going to college at that time because I just wasn't mentally or maturely prepared for the rigors of the study. So, you know, I thought about what I was going to do, and when my parents were on vacation, I joined the Army. Now, my father, he spent 26 years in the Marine Corps. He was in from 1943 until 1970, so he was in all of the major wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So, I grew up in this military style of life. My father was a very serious man about his faith, a very serious man about the military and being a colonel in the Marine Corps, right? He raised us very much with this fortitude in life. And so when he came home from vacation, the first thing I said was, hey, mom and dad, guess what? I joined the army, which he was a little disappointed that it was the army uh, and not the Marine Corps, but uh, he said, oh, okay, well, all right, son, and for how long? And I said, four, four years. And he goes, huh, well, after four years in the Army, you're going to be ready for college. I promise you that. And sure enough, those words were true. But I, I, when I went to the recruiter, I, I first, I just asked for really two things. I wanted to be guaranteed jump school, and I wanted to be stationed in Germany. So those were kind of, and I wanted to go to basic training as soon as humanly possible. So those were kind of my criteria, which, you know, the Army loves that sort of flexibility because they can stick you in any job that they need you in. Well, at that time, the way I could get guaranteed jump school, guaranteed Germany, uh, and guaranteed to go as soon as possible was they stuck me in an M1 main battle tank, right? So that was my first foray into the military. So I went to basic training in AIT at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I immediately went to Fort Benning and went through jump school. And upon completing jump school, I was stationed in Bayreuth, Germany in the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. And so it was there that I began to sort of come into my own. The 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment was in charge of patrolling the East German and Czechoslovakian borders. That was back when it was the Cold War and the height of the Soviet Union, uh, and we never expected the Soviet Union to collapse as it did. But I was just in the middle of all of, of those things. That was, I got there in 1988, I left Germany in 1990, but in the interim, uh, I had a fascination with Germany, and I, I learned German fairly quickly. I was able to speak German uh, and go out with German friends. And I had some German friends, and they used to say, like, it's not fair that every time we go out, we have to speak English. But you were in our country, you should learn German. So I did. I learned German fairly quickly. And that's really what began a very different style of military service for me. Because uh, as a young private who could now speak German pretty fluently, they needed somebody to go to kind of the German equivalent of ranger school uh, with the German army. And so my commander said, hey, Flynn, you speak German pretty well, right? And I was like, oh yeah, I do okay. And he said, well, you're gonna go to German ranger school, the equivalent of German ranger school. And I was like, oh, you know, sir, I'm not really interested in that. I, I like riding on a tank, like, means I don't have to walk. And so, right, but he said, well, it's already done. So. They sent me to this school with the Germans. It was really a, a fantastic school. And it was down in Oberammergau, which is also famous 
for its passion play that they do every 10 years. But at that time, I was not in the faith. After high school, I really got into atheism. I, I was not interested in God. I was not interested in the restrictions of God and what he would put on me. And so going to Oberammergau and that region right, really meant nothing to me. But I got down there and I had a great time with the German army. It was really a growing experience for me. And when I finished, uh, the commander of the school called me into his office and he said, uh, Flynn, it was great to have you here. Everybody enjoyed uh, having an American come through this course with us. Uh, we would like to invite you to go to our sniper school. And I said, well, sir, I appreciate that, but I think I'm ready to go back to my unit and just be, a, you know, an American soldier and ride around on a nice comfy tank. And he said, well, I already talked to your commander and it's already done. So as the Army does, I got voluntold one more time, right, that I was going to go through sniper school. So I went through sniper school, again, down near Oberammergau uh, and another training area called Grafenbeer. Uh, if anybody who's been stationed in the Army in Europe Right, these are probably familiar places. I went through sniper school. It was another great experience. The Germans are amazing marksmen and they are amazing uh, at the trajectory of a bullet and the area under a curve and all of the things that go into shooting. And so you know, I, I got, gained a great respect for the rifle and a bullet and, and what it can do. And they were amazing teachers. When I finished, though, you know, they kind of call it the gentleman's sniper school uh, course, which I didn't meet any gentleman at all when I was in sniper school, but there, there we have it. But they, so when I got back to my unit, finally, right, got back to my unit, uh, the Army said, hey, since you've been through this German course equivalent to Ranger School, you've been through this sniper school, uh, for Germany and for some other countries in NATO. Uh, we would like to send you to Fort Bragg to go to the ATIC, the Advanced Target Interdiction Course. And so I said, well, you know, that's really great, but I'm not really interested. I want to get back on my tank where I can ride. And they said, well, that's very nice, Specialist Flynn. Uh, here's your ticket to Fort Bragg. So I go to Fort Bragg and, and went through that school. Well, at this point, now the wall has fallen, right? Uh, Germany is completely different. Uh, I'm now back in the United States. And of course, the first Gulf War begins kicking up. And so, right, as Iraq goes into Kuwait, we get mobilized. Uh, and I was assigned to the 18th Airborne Corps then as a, as a Corps sniper. So it was a, a scary experience. You know, I, when I joined the Army, I mean, we hadn't been to war since Vietnam. And I never imagined in my wildest dreams that there would be a war during my four-year stint. But just like most of life, it's not what you want or what you expect. It's just what happens. And so well, I remember being on the plane and going over to Saudi Arabia, and oh, we were scared. Right? We, we were terrified. They'd been telling us, that they expect maybe 15% casualties and, and other things. So it was, it was a scary time for, you know, well, at that time, a, a 19 or 20 year old young man. But yet, you know, you do what you're called to do and you go to where the Army tells you to go. And so I got there and had my experiences over in the first Gulf War. The 18th Airborne Corps was the left flank of the uh, attack into Kuwait. So we went around into Iraq, then down over into Kuwait. We ended up getting into Kuwait City, uh, and there we cleared buildings and got the rest of the Republican National Guard out of, out of Kuwait. So, right, it was scary and exciting. And it was really at that moment I missed, most especially, the M1 tank, right? Because as a sniper, you're, you're almost completely exposed, right? You've got a vest, you've got a helmet, you've got your weapon systems. But in a tank, right, you've got, you know, 
tons and tons of armor that, that help keep you safe. It, it's thick and it's strong and it's made of depleted uranium and, and different alloy elements that, that make it nearly impenetrable. We, we learned in that first Gulf War, coming up against the Russian-made T-64s and T-72s and some of the other tanks, that their bullets couldn't even penetrate the M1. And I remember thinking, you know, as the artillery was coming in and the, the tanks were firing and the bullets were flying, I wish I was back in a tank. Right? I, I wish I was back in that protected mode instead of running around in a Humvee and a thing called a, a fast attack vehicle. It's, you ever watch Rat Patrol? It was like a Rat Patrol vehicle. Right? And so it, it was maybe long for more protection. And I think that's really the very crux of the talk today, right? It is, number one, why is armor important? Why is armor important? Why, why do we need it? Right? Many people, you know, want to go out and they, they want to fight a spiritual battle, but they don't want to prepare themselves. They don't want to get, they, they don't want to put on the armor that's necessary to win the war. One of the things that those of you who are combat veterans understand is, you know, having armor on, whether it's a Kevlar helmet and a vest or an M1 tank, is it becomes your friend, right? It becomes right, not just something that protects you, it, it becomes part of who you are. You have to learn to maneuver with it and work with it so that you can be protected. In our modern day, right, we are fighting a spiritual war. It really, it's not just our modern day. We've been fighting a spiritual war for, well, thousands of years. Right? Ever since the fall of man, we, we've been in a spiritual war. Right? It's one where Satan is trying to win souls for hell. And I think one of the things that's different in the modern day that many, than probably any other time within our history is, We've lost, even in, the, in our Catholic Church, and even within Christianity as a whole, this notion of judgment, of judgment. I think most people don't necessarily, even church-going Catholics, even church-going Christians, don't necessarily really, truly believe that judgment day will come. And I think that's what makes our spiritual battle so much more difficult in the modern day than it, than it has been in the past. People had this internal notion. You know, when I grew up in Granbury, nobody used the word atheist. Now, there are plenty of non-believers within Granbury High School, but nobody would ever admit to it. Most people went to church. Most people had parents that were of faith. Now, that doesn't last, though. We see in the modern day where people are losing their faith and people are... Really, even those with faith, their faith is incomplete because they forget one of the most important things within our life, which is our death. And that, that comes with judgment. Now, look, we as Christians don't have to be afraid of judgment, but we do have to take it seriously. And it's important, especially for men. Right? Men of the family are one of the most important and most impactful representatives of God in the modern world, or in any part of the world. And it, they did a study in Switzerland. This was 1994, so it's been a number of years. But I, I've kept this, this study in my mind for many years now. You know, what did they find in this study in Switzerland? They found that the Father's faith is the number one most critical factor for determining if the parents' religion will be carried through to the next generation. But the, the most important is the father's faith. If both, if both the father and the mother attend church regularly and pray, 33% of their children will end up as regular churchgoers. So that's if both the father and the mother are churchgoers and prayers. 41% will end up attending irregularly, but they'll still go to church sometimes. And one quarter of those will end up not practicing their faith at all. Right, so that, that's if both the father and the mother are practicing. If the father is an irregular practicer of the faith or doesn't practice and the mother is, 
which is, happens in so many of our Catholic families today, right? The, the mother is more zealous about their faith than the father. Then only 3% of the children will become regular churchgoers themselves. So if the mother is a faithful woman, and we know so many faithful mothers, and the father is not, 3% will become regular churchgoers themselves. Right, that's a drop of 30% from if both are. And 59% will become a regular, and 38% will be lost to the faith completely. Right, so that's if the father practices and the mother, or excuse me, the father does not practice and the mother does. If the father is not, it is, uh, if the father is practicing, and the, and the mother is not, extraordinarily enough, 38% will become regular church-going Christians. So it goes up from, if it was both the father and the mother, from 33 to 38. And that seems an amazing kind of statistic to me. Now, that could be because there's not a whole lot of households where the father practices and the mother doesn't. I think it's mostly the other way around. But what we see, right, 44% will become a regular, and the rest will fall away. But we see now, right, that, that the ones that fall away is a much smaller percentage. And why is that? It's because we have faith in the Father, right? Uh, the Lord our God, the Father. And so, right, all of our prayers, even at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, are all systematically done to the Father. Right there, they're for the Father, through the Son. And so, right, uh, the Father is an important figure. If we have a, a poor sense of fatherhood, we'll have a poor sense of God. If we have a poor sense of who our earthly Father is, we, we may never come to know who our heavenly Father is. And so it's important uh, maybe more important than ever, that men stand up right, and become the spiritual leaders of their household. You know, you can, you can go through life and you can fake a lot of things. But when it comes to faith, your children know above all else whether you're faking or not. They, they can see whether you pray or not. They can see whether you're serious about faith or not. They, they can tell whether you're hypocritical in your faith or not. That's why it's so important for fathers, especially, to be the spiritual lead of their household, showing the love of our Heavenly Father. I, I remember, you know, I, I had my falling away from the faith for a period of time. But there, there's an image in my head that is burned within my brain. And that's after communion, when we would go to Mass. We went to Mass every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation in the Flynn household. Every Sunday, my father would come back from communion, right? He would come back from receiving the Lord, body and blood, soul and divinity. He would kneel down, and he would take off his glasses, and he would put his hands over his face, and he would pray. And I remember that kind of burned into my brain. So even when I was away, even when I was away from the faith and away from God and, a, and an atheist, that, that image always was there for me. And I think it was one of those things that helped bring me back. You know, if a three-war Marine Corps colonel that had that sort of humility of faith, I think that's what helped me gain a humility to bring me back to the faith. And so, right within that, we come to understand what it is the man is supposed to be doing. Right? Uh, fighting the battle. You're going before the family, showing them the way. To be a leader, we, we've learned far too often, you can't lead from the back. Right? You, can't, you can't lead from cowardice. You have to lead with a sense of purpose. But one of the things about, about that is that in order to have confidence in battle, it is important to have armor. Having a helmet, especially if you, uh, the modern day Kevlar helmet is a pretty amazing helmet. But if you look back 
in history, World War II and Korea, right? That, that helmet was not gonna stop a bullet. Right? It just it wasn't physically able. But so why did we wear them? Because it gave you confidence. Right? It gave you the confidence to be able to rush out of your foxhole or rush out of the trenches or rush in to battle. Right? Armor gives you confidence. It gives you the ability to do things you wouldn't normally choose to do. And so that's why we wear it. And we see in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, very important for our spiritual battle. In Ephesians, we hear the words, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers, of this world's darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so uh, we see now, right, there is a battle going on. We, there is a battle for which we need armor. Right? It, if we kind of break this down just a little bit, right, uh, we're going to take Ephesians 16, 13 through 18, right, and just kind of break it out a little bit. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. When the day of evil comes, and you will be able to stand your ground, and having done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness arrayed, and with your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you, have, you can extinguish all flaming arrows and of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. So, first of all, when evil comes, right, one of the things that we have to be aware of is that evil comes. Right, the, the spiritual battle is here, yes. And it's also coming because Satan never quits. He never gives up. He never tires. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat. He doesn't do anything but think about the destruction of souls. That that's his 24-7, 365, unless it's a leap year, then it's 366, right? A way of doing business, right? He doesn't need rest or food or shelter or R&R, &R, or any of those things that we as human beings do. So, so we're battling against powers and principalities, right? not just flesh and blood. And well, we have to remember that we are in a spiritual battle. It's here. You know, we look at history, and especially World War II, right? we see Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain was the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the very beginning of World War II. You know, and what did Neville Chamberlain do? He had a policy of appeasement, which was very popular, both here in the United States and, and all over Europe. So let's appease Hitler. Let's appease that which is evil. So, you know, we'll throw him a bone and give him Austria. Right? I mean, that, that's a pretty good trade, that way we don't have to be in war. And that's understandable because we have to remember, you know, almost a million Brits died during World War I. It was a horrible war, right? Great Britain saw great suffering during this time. They did not want to get involved with another major war. So, so they, were, they were weary of war. They didn't want to fight. The Neville, Neville Chamberlain tried to appease the evil in the world. In this case, Hitler. And what came from that appeasement? Well, next was Poland. Right next was uh, the other countries of Northern Europe. There we see that Hitler had no had no intention of stopping. He had no intention of just letting things be, because evil is never satiated. It never stops. It never rests. It always moves forward. 
That's why it takes good men standing up with the armor of Christ to stop that. So, so we have to know the spiritual battle. And he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to, you may be able to stand your ground. That, that armor that protects us helps us stand firm. Well, we have to stand firm. Right, but what's happened in our Christian world in the modern day, well, let's take prayer out of public schools. Well, that's reasonable because the government pays for it, so, you know, we should take, boom, we take a step back. Did we stand firm? No, almost nobody said anything. Oh, let's make abortion legal. Did the Christians stand firm? Nah, we backed up. Well, you know, the Supreme Court said it, so, okay. Right? The very few stood up to fight. Ooh, we see right, faith and atheists and other things coming within our world. Many times, our first reaction is, well, hmm, Neville Chamberlain, let's appease. Well, let's shoot. We'll give up a little ground here, but you know, we're going to make it up later. Once you've lost ground in battle, it's almost impossible to gain it back. It, it takes many lives, and... and Lots of blood, sweat, and tears. It's better to just not let it happen. But when we've let it happen as Christian men, we've allowed right, Satan to move. Boom, boom, boom. Right, Austria, Poland, Northern Europe, eventually France, eventually Russia, right, eventually trying to get Great Britain itself. But when we see that appeasement doesn't work, and so we have to stand firm. That's called fortitude. Being able to stand firm in God. Being able to do what God asks. Because what we're trying to do is stop the slow regression into chaos. Our Lord is a God of order. He created the universe with order. And we as godly people, especially godly men, have to regain order during chaos. So he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So truth, right, we have to remember, truth is not a philosophical or a theological abstraction. It's not an opinion. It doesn't come from polls. It doesn't come from consensus. Truth is God himself. I'm the way and the truth and the light. Right, so we see right, truth is important. But we have to be immersed in truth then for us to know the truth. Praying, reading scripture, reading the catechism, being serious about forming our conscience. Right, we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, since you have, in obedience to truth, purified your souls for sincere love of your brothers, fervently love one another. Right, so we see, right in 1 Peter, how, how do we truly love our brother? By being obedient to that which is true. You, there is no love without truth. We like to sometimes compromise the truth in order to get along. Let's go along to get along. Let's do what Neville Chamberlain did, and appease. Well, let's not share our opinion too strongly, because then people may not like us. We see in Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of such things. Right, so what we see, right, our Lord is telling us, be obedient to the truth. Then how do we know something is true? Well, if it's in Scripture or the church tells us it's true, we know it's true. But we also can tell it, right, is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Is it excellent or praiseworthy? Or we can take a look at ourselves and see those instances where... Or not noble, not right, not pure, not lovely, not admirable, not praiseworthy, not excellent. 
And so, right, if we're going to conform ourselves to that which is true, we have to be men of beauty, men of conviction, men of right and pure. But when we compromise ourselves, we compromise our purity, we compromise our orthodoxy, we compromise our love by not being obedient to that which is true. Satan will always try to say, well, right, love is love. Love is love. Right, but love is not just whatever you feel. Right, love is an action. Right, it's not a feeling. What we see when Christ died on the cross, the ultimate form of love, total self-sacrifice for the life of another. That that's what true love is. It's not butterflies and buttercups. It's total self-gift to the point of death for the life of another. It's self-sacrificial by definition. And it's painful as the cross can only be. It, it, it causes us great pain. And the Lord says, right, I did not come to unite. I came to divide. And oftentimes, we, we try not to divide ourselves. And we, we shouldn't except with truth. But we shouldn't intentionally try to be the mean Christian, right? We, we should do all things in love, all things in charity, all things with kindness. But you see, being kind, it doesn't always mean being nice. I think what's happened in our world is that people, and especially men, have decided why I need to be nice. I've never seen the word be nice in scripture. I have seen the word be kind. Kindness, though, is a charity, and charity is a love, and love is a self-sacrifice, and a self-sacrifice means death to those things in ourselves that we have to get rid of. Death to sin. Death to those things that are heterodox. Death to the, the way of life maybe we lived before. So it's important for us, right, to be immersed in that truth. Be immersed in that which is good and holy and right and beautiful. So that we may right, truly be men of prayer, men of righteousness. Right, and that's the next part, the breastplate of righteousness. Right, it, it, so you have the belt of truth. Now what is the, in the military, if you've been in the military, we used to wear body protection. What, what held all that up? You would think, well, my shoulders. But anybody who's had a rucksack knows that you don't hold up your rucksack by your shoulders. You actually hold it up around your waist because that's a much stronger vehicle for moving the rucksack. It's a much stronger vehicle for doing God's will. It's a much stronger vehicle of carrying a burden. Right? So right, we would put our when we would carry our rucksack, we would make it a little loose in the shoulders and really tight around the waist. So the truth right, has to be tight around us. And that bears the load of the breastplate. Right? In battle, the breastplate defends our vital organs. Defends our vital organs. Right? The, the breastplate of Christ right, defends our vital life our life of grace that we received in baptism. But what is righteousness, right? The breastplate of righteousness. What, what does that mean? Righteousness is the quality of being right in the eyes of God. So it's the quality of being right in the eyes of God, not the eyes of man, not the eyes of the world, especially the secular world. Right? It involves our character, our conscience, our conduct, and our command. Our character is our nature. Our, our character is our, what we project out into the world. Our conscience, a well-formed conscience, which helps us know decisions and what is right and what is wrong. Our conduct and our actions and our word. That's what righteousness is. Being righteous in the eyes of God in our nature, attitude, actions, and words. It's so important in our modern world. Right? And doing what we believe, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, being 
the man God wants us to be. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. I, I remember I, I had a, a great vantage point for the largest tank battle that happened since World War II. I was up on a hill in my vehicle uh, surveying, and as our armies, as the Republican Guard and our armies were coming together, I had this great vantage point of watching this tank battle. And one of the things that I saw was the T-64 and the T-72, the Russian tanks that were being used. Their bullets would literally just bounce off. Literally just bounce off. But they just didn't, they didn't have power. I remember there was one tank, it, it took a direct hit. Direct hit, and I thought, oh my gosh. I don't, these guys probably didn't survive. So I jumped in my vehicle, me and my buddy rushed down to that tank. And we, I jumped on top and I had a hammer and I started beating on the hatch and the guy's like, but what? I was like, dude, you got hit. He goes, oh, I wonder what that sound was. But they didn't even, they hardly realized it. And they had taken a direct hit from, I, I think it was a T-64, which is a little bit older of a tank. But it, it was unbelievable how unscathed they were. Right, so when we take up the shield of faith, what we're doing is, you know, Satan's arrows don't even, you, can, you don't even notice them. But what happens is, if you don't have that shield, you, you're just sitting duck. Right without that, the armor of the tank, there's no way those men could have survived a T-64 round. So, so for us, right, it's important that we have the shield of faith to protect us. That way, we don't even know that Satan is shooting arrows at us. They just bounce right off without even us noticing. But, but when we have, uh, when we go it alone, when we go it ourselves, we don't have the faith that moves us that protects us, then we're just sitting ducks for the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then take the helmet of salvation. Wait, what, it, what does a helmet do? The helmet protects your head, your mind, your intellect, your conscience. Right, so the helmet of salvation is that one thing within our life that, that gives the most important, well, one of the most important parts of our body, protection. Right, the helmet is what keeps all the other organs working. Because, right, without our head, we'll, there's not much left. So we have to have the helmet of salvation. But it's not just any salvation, it's salvation in Christ Jesus. Right, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's where we get our salvation, is through faith in Jesus Christ. Not in ourself, not in society, not in consensus, not in popularity, but, but in Jesus Christ himself. So, so it's important that we stay focused in on our salvation. Again, when I started the talk, one of the things I said was, one of the things we've lost in this world is the notion of judgment we've lost the notion of judgment, losing the notion of salvation is soon to happen. It's important for us as men to really take that seriously. Right, I, I oftentimes think, you know, we have, we have the cure for eternal death. We, we have the cure. And those of you who have been a parishioner of mine in one of my parishes know that this is one of my favorite sayings. That we, we have a cure for death, for eternal death, for damnation. And yet we act like it's just for ourselves. We oftentimes act like, gosh, well, I don't want to be offensive, so I, I, maybe I shouldn't talk about Jesus at work. Maybe I shouldn't talk about Jesus in the store. Maybe I shouldn't talk about Jesus among my friends who aren't Christians. Because I don't, you don't want to offend them. But if they're plagued with the cancer of doubt and of, of no faith, right, isn't it more charitable to give them the cure than it is to just let them die? 
But if I had the cure for cancer, if I came up with a cure for cancer, and I said, well, you know, it's none of my business if somebody else has cancer. It's not for me to give them the cure. They gotta work it out on their own. Well, what would we call that person? Selfish, mean, despicable. Yet, what do we as Christians do? We have the cure for eternal death. And what do we do with it? Well, hmm, I'm going to keep it to myself. Gosh, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to make people uncomfortable. This I promise. I mean, I don't know much. But hell is uncomfortable. So, so why not make them a little uncomfortable now and spare them eternal discomfort in eternity to come? No, why not, why not share? I mean, if we don't share the cure, how do people get better? The Ethiopian eunuch, how do I know what I'm reading unless somebody tells me? How do I know? Now, how do people who don't have faith know that what they need is salvation? If we as Christians keep the cure to ourselves, are selfish, we would think that that person who has the cure for cancer, if they kept it to themselves, what is the worst person on earth? What does that say about us as Christian men? Well, what does that say about us who don't share our faith? Uh, I was a few weeks ago. I was at the store, and I was not I was not uh, dressed like a priest. I it was my day off, and I ran to the store. And, you know, I think I had shorts and a and m shirt on, and my mask, of course. And this young guy comes up to me, and he says, "Hey, I just want to say I can see the love of Christ in you. Would you like to pray?" I was like, "Man, I'd love it." He prayed over me, we got talking, and he said, I can just tell by your demeanor in this, in this, in this shopping, in, in this store, that you're a Christian man. And I remember thinking how, how awesome it is. And then, you know, how many times have I done that? How many times have I gone up to somebody in a store and said, hey, I just want to tell you, you're awesome, I'd love to pray with you. I have done it once since then, because I was inspired by this young man. He didn't know I was a priest. He didn't know I was a pastor. He didn't know I was a Christian for sure. But he came bold enough to come up and pray with me. Pray. He knows he's got the cure, and he wants to share it. You've got the cure. What do you do with it? Right, and we have to have right the sword of the spirit which is the Word of God. You know, years ago, I got to hear the late and great Dr., uh, or excuse me, Deacon Alex Jones. He, he was an amazing speaker. And he came to my parish up in Pilot Point, St. Thomas Aquinas in Pilot Point, and, and gave a retreat. It was fantastic. And I remember, he, he got up, and, and if you've ever seen Deacon Alex Jones, he's a, he was a, a, a just imposing, amazing black preacher. And he preached with that black Christian zeal that is so infectious and awesome. And he said, right, the one question he gets all the time is, what was it like going from Pentecostal to Catholic? What is it like going from Pentecostal to Catholic? Praying in the spirit to being a Catholic. It's almost like, well, Catholics don't pray in the spirit. But it says, right, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we as Christian people, right, we have the sword of the Spirit. So we pray in the Spirit. And he said, I'm still a Pentecostal. I'm just in the church that was at Pentecost. Amen. <laughs> right, I'm still Pentecostal. I'm just in the church that was at Pentecost. We are a Pentecostal pe people. You are a Pentecostal man. You just have forgot, maybe. You just have... have thought about, you know, praying in the Spirit. We, we as Catholics, we get a little uncomfortable sometimes when someone raises their hands or yells out amen or, or has a euphoric experience with Jesus Christ. But 
We are all Pentecostal people. But to be a Pentecostal person is more than just the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's living in the Spirit 24-7, 365. And I remember when I was confirmed as a young man. I was like many young men who have been confirmed. I, I didn't really care that much about confirmation. At that point, I, I was already kind of moving away from my faith. And but, uh, Bishop Delaney, who was the Bishop of Fort Worth, came to Granbury, Texas and confirmed me. Now the amazing part is, a kid who didn't really care about confirmation, who didn't really understand confirmation, and didn't really understand the faith, and didn't really understand the Eucharist, right? Uh, I still remember to this day what he said in his homily. I still remember to this day what, what Bishop Delaney told our group of confirmandi that day. And he said, there's going to be a tough road ahead. Tough roads ahead. You're going to have questions of faith. You're, you might doubt your faith. You're going to question God. He said, you can always look back to this day when you received the Holy Spirit and call upon that same Holy Spirit and return back. Where we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have received it. It's nourished every time we go to communion. We are a Pentecostal people. And we were... We're in the church. That was at Pentecost. So that should mean even more for us. And it says, which is the word of God? Now, the one question you might be asking, okay, Father, we're in this spiritual battle. We got all this armor, right? We got swords and helmets and shields and breastplates and belts. How does it all come together for a fight? Well, now I'm going to tell you. It comes from Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell the stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand in the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and its splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. So, right now we see, this is how Jesus Christ fought Satan. So how do we fight Satan? The same way. And what's the pivotal word? It is written. And that's, right, that comes from Scripture. And those who are, those who are ignorant of Scripture are ignorant, are ignorant of Christ. We as Catholic people have to be immersed in Scripture. How did, how did Jesus defeat Satan in this instance? By quoting Scripture. Now here's something that I just learned, well, about 10 years ago or so, so it's been a little bit, but I'd never seen, I'd never noticed until one day when I was reading this very passage, where Satan also uses scripture. Right? Jesus, Satan says, it is written. It is written. See, oftentimes, who knows scripture better than any of us? The devil. Who knows Jesus better than anyone? Satan. Right? He knows it better than any of us. He's just rejected. So, so when, when we hear oftentimes, oh, I, I've had, you know, great Christian people come up to me and say, you know, do you know Jesus Christ? And my response is always, Satan knows Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? Do, do you love him? That, that's what separates us. Satan knows Jesus better than any of us. 
Satan knows scripture better than you. Scripture, uh, Satan knows scripture better than me. But we have the ability to know what is true. That's why, when you think of the scripture is your map. It outlines the topography by which you get to salvation. But when you look at a map, I learned in the army, looking at a map, it, anybody who knows me knows I'm, I'm, a, I'm a horrible, I mean terrible map reader. I barely made it through the schools I had to go through in the army because of how bad I was at orienteering. And so, right, and there are many times where I look at a map and I'm like, Right, a map, if you don't know where you are, and you don't know where you're going, a map doesn't do you any good. Right, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, just handing somebody a map and saying, congratulations, I gave you a map, now find your way to heaven. What? It's impossible. It's impossible. So, so what's the next component? The compass. Now with a compass and a map, you can do a lot. You can look at that hill over there and shoot an azimuth and do a back azimuth and do shoot another one over here on a water tower. Get a, you know exactly where you are. The, the compass is the second most important thing. Well, many of us, we, we rely upon just our own mind, our own heart to, to interpret scripture. That's why I said in the beginning, you need a Bible and a catechism. Right? The, the Bible is the map. But if you don't know where you are, and you don't know where you're going, the map does you no good. The compass is the catechism. The catechism is what tells us as Christian people what is true in Scripture and what is not. What the valley really is and what the valley is not. You know, one of the things that you, you learn when you're in the military is a straight line is not always the best way to get to where you're going. Oftentimes, you have to go around rivers, find an easier path through the mountains, right? get to a tunnel, not just climb for no reason. If all you have is a map and you have no compass, you have no direction, you have no guidance. That's why we have the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It gives us guidance. That's why it's so important. That's why our loving and caring Christian brothers and sisters who are not part of the one true church, the Catholic Church, can easily get lost. Because they've got a map, they're staring at the map, and they see everything that we see. But they don't have the compass to get them to where they need to go. And so it's imperative for us as Catholic men to remember we've got both a map and a compass. If you just try to figure it out on your own, you'll never get anywhere. Right? If you got nowhere to go, you'll always find your way. But if you have a direction, if you have a place, which in our case is heaven, you got to bring it all together. You got to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You have to immerse yourself in the beauty of the Magisterium, which helps gives us truth. Right, so it's important for us as Christian people. It's important for us to stay away from Satan. So stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. Right, we, we pray in union with all Christian people. Here on earth, up in heaven, we pray for those in purgatory. Well, with all the saints, we can call upon their power We can call upon their goodness. Uh, when I was a seminarian, I did the Camino Santiago in Spain. Many of you probably saw the movie The Way. And in The Way, one of the things I learned as I went along the Camino, I read about it in the book, that you're going to look around, you'll find these little things called fletches. They're arrows painted in yellow that will point you in the right direction. So what you do is you come to an intersection, and you'd, be, you'd look around, and you would look and look and look, and then, oh, Oh, there's a fletcher pointing me there. Okay, so I go this way. 
And all along the way, there's these fletches, these arrows pointing you in the right direction. I don't know who put them there. They could have been a crazy person, right? But I followed them because, right, that, that's the only way I was going to. I had a map and a compass, but I'm terrible at that. I needed more help. So, so following those fletches, that's the sense. People have gone before us. We don't have to figure it all out ourselves. They've gone and, and put arrows all over. Well, if you don't see them, though, you can't follow them. But I, I spent a semester in Spain in a, in a town called Salamanca when I was in my undergrad. And, and there's fletches all over Salamanca. When I was a college student, still at that time, away from the faith, do you know any of those fletches I saw? Zero. Zero. I didn't see any of them. I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know Salamanca was a stop along the Via Plata of the Camino Santiago. I had no clue. Once I got to Salamanca again through my pilgrimage, they're everywhere. You could hardly look without finding a fletcher pointing you in the right direction. That, that's our faith. That's our faith in the saints. That's our journey with each other. So let's do, just do a little recap, and then we'll go into some awesome adoration of our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. It's important for men to take up their battle position. It's important for us to know where we are. It's important for you as a man to be a leader. And the only way to do that safely for you and your family is to put on the armor of Christ. The only way to do that is to suit up and to do it. You can sit and talk about it and think about it and pray about it, but if you're not going to do it, it's just empty words and promises. But make sure that you as a Christian man are fighting the good fight, right? are winning the race, are doing your part. Don't be a coward. Because whether you're a coward stuck in a cave, pulled out, kicking and screaming, or whether you run out into battle valiantly, the same end will take you. That is death itself. So, so we can face it valiantly. We can be courageous. But only if we have the armor of Christ, which gives us courage and protection and strength. Let's remember that the Lord is with us that we are a Pentecostal people, that you are a man of faith, that God desires you to be a leader within this world. And make sure you pray, and pray fervently and daily, and that your family sees that, so that someday maybe your son can look back and remember you in prayer and turn back himself. Take care and God bless. And I look forward to praying at the Blessed Sacrament with you in a moment. Uh, we've worked through a lot of things uh, to make this happen. And I really appreciate all your time and effort. If you're listening online, please feel, feel free to join us. Join our mission, our cause. Become an ambassador to your parish. Uh, become a part of our leadership team. If you can, donate to our cause so that we can put on more events like this. Most important, we want you to leave today a little bit better, a little bit further in your faith journey. We pray that uh, Father Flynn has given you an insight that God has moved through him to work into your life and in your family. So once again, thank you for coming to the Experience Use Renewal. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.